thank you in confidence that you are the God who not only knows the need ahead of time, but you already know the solution. And so, Father, we're, all we're going to do is just say thank you, God, for what you are doing right now. We lay all of these needs at your feet. God, we declare over the bodies the Lord God, those that are sick, those that are recuperating, Lord, we just declare healing right now by the blood of Jesus Christ. And that, Lord God, by that blood we are saved and delivered and healed. And so, Father, we not only speak healing over the body, but the mind as well. And that, Father, those that are dealing with frustration, heartache, anxiety, uh, questions, Lord Jesus, we pray right now that you cut through that fog because, Lord, our peace is not given by this world. Our peace is not established because of a lack of conflict. Our peace is decided because Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Come on, someone. And so, Lord, we declare right now that peace is sustaining us and that, Lord God, the only reason we're not going to have peace is because we release it. Instead, Lord God, we declare that your peace be upon us, holding us fast, holding us firm, and that, Lord God, nothing will shake us. We are like the house built on the rock. And that, Father God, we are not going to be shaken. Stir our faith, Lord God. Stir our faith to remember how great our God is and in comparison how small our problems are. And that, Father, we lift up all across this room, Lord, those that are dealing with things, unsaved loved ones, uh, uh, wayward kids, Father, the stuff of life. Lord, we're just declaring right now, move in your people's lives. Because, Lord, what we have in our life is not problems. What we have in our life is a testimony that's ready to happen. That, Lord God, there are miracles ready to be performed and received. And so, Father, let us not look at our life as full of problems, but look at them as opportunities for testimony that are ready to come forth. So, Holy Spirit, move in our lives. Move in our hearts. Move in our church. Move, Lord God, wherever we find ourselves. Let the light of Christ shine through us to push back the darkness. And God, I'm going to say thank you for that right now. Greater, mm, <coughs> greater is he that is in me than he that's in this world. Let us stand on that right now in the name of Jesus. And somebody said amen. 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 <coughs> Excuse me. I'm going to take those glasses off because they're making my hearing aid whistle. Anybody, I'm just curious. Anybody else in here? You have a hearing aid on, you put a cowboy hat on, and it just starts squealing. Thank you. I'm glad there's somebody who feels my pain. All right. Thank you, Mark. You're going to heaven. Um, <laughs> let's see. Uh, we do have uh, handouts down here. Mr. Paul, Mr. Mark, y'all can help me out <clears throat> real quick. Yesterday was National Brothers and Sisters Day. Hopefully you got hold of your, your siblings and... Let them know you love them, or at least harass them. Um, sandwiches and chips were great. Let's give a hand of appreciation for all those that brought food today. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, tomorrow is the National Day of Prayer. And so we put an insert in the bulletin uh, back on Sunday that has seven different areas. Listen, if you'll spend one minute on each of those things, and a minute praising the Lord, and a minute... Uh, uh, giving him thanks for what he's doing you can spend 10 minutes in prayer hallelujah and uh, so I'm asking you be sure and take those seven things and take them to God uh, anytime tomorrow but around around the country at the noon hour in the different time zones is specifically when it's taking place across America so I do ask that y'all be in prayer for America tomorrow is the national day of prayer and then, how do you know, after you pray, you need to give God glory. So on Cinco de Mayo. Amen. Oh, come on. They're going to have Mexican food at the marriage supper of the Lamb, if you didn't know that. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes. Right. 
Amen. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Amen. God is good. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing that. I mean, you know, we have those tough weeks. We have tough months. Anybody in here ever had a tough year? Okay, I'm just just curious. The last three years have been tough. That's probably because your husband. I, I mean, it. No, okay. I was just checking. Arch, put your hand down. That's, I've had a tough. How many years have we been here? I've had it. Yeah. We'll talk about that later. Okay. Um, we do have on the fifth and the sixth. Just a reminder. Those of you that might go out to Salado, they are having the Cowboy Poet and all that sort of thing. Uh, there is a poster out here on the the bulletin chicken wire out here. We don't have a bulletin board. So, I mean, it's the bulletin chicken wire. There's no, yeah. It's just fun to say chicken wire. But go out there and see the poster. But you can't be gone on the 7th. It's the 5th, 6th, and 7th, but you can't be there on the 7th. You have to be here because we are having our junior PBR bull ride here, and y'all need to be here. Wear your boots. Guys, you can wear your hats. Do not spit on the floor. That's all I'm asking. That's all I'm asking. So, <clears throat> all right. So, as we continue on, this is our next to the last in this issue on having healthy churches. I was looking online today and because uh, sometimes as a pastor and even as a church member do what? Children's church. We, <clears throat> I talked to Mary Jo about that and I can't remember what we decided. <clears throat> so Mike, if you'd help me remember to talk to your wife after church, I I think I think they may be dismissing children's church to be in here. I think so. Don't quote me on that, huh? Yeah, I th I think that's what it was. And since I'm since I am the pastor, I just will command it right now. We'll just I, but don't throw rocks. Don't throw rocks until you, you know, walked a mile in my moccasins and all that sort of thing. So, um, but dealing with healthy churches, I was looking online today, just had a mental itch to look. America, <clears throat> uh, conservatively speaking, America has at least 300,000 churches in it. We are one of 300,000 churches in America. It also very, very conservatively speaking, because there's no way to gauge it, but when you Google, like, how many churches are in the world, they'll tell you there must be a lot because there's a lot of Christians in the world. But there's no number because you can't trace that, especially in a lot of the third world nations, uh, underground churches in communist nations. It's easy to say <clears throat> there's a million it's probably closer to about 2 million churches in the world today. I find that refreshing because I realize I'm not the only one. Siri was trying to tell me how many churches were in the world today. <laughs> but I like knowing I'm not the only one. I'm not the only pastor of a church. We're not the only body of believers serving Jesus Christ. That's why we pray. We pray every Sunday for a neighboring church locally, but then uh, for a country. We pray that way because it helps us to remember we are not the only body of Christ. Amen. We are not the only church. And Jesus said in John chapter 16, I believe it was, I was reading my little brown book today, and it was Jesus was saying, uh, um, I and the Father are one, and those that are with me are one, and those that call on my name, we're all one. Nothing hurts so much as church wars. 
when, and besides the skirmishes that happen within the four walls of a church, but when you have people that want to attack, well, we don't like the Baptist, or we don't like the Presbyterian, or we don't like this, or we don't like that, and uh, we don't like Pentecostals because they're weird. <laughs> we are. It, it's a thing for those of us. And But have you understand we are one in Jesus Christ. Amen. And that there should not be anything but unity among the churches. That's why we pray for churches. That's what we're praying for when we pray for other nations. So I pray that that catches a hold in your spirit. Because that's what we're trying to do. We're not the only one. And uh, I will tell you right now, we are a blessed church. Amen. Come on. We are a blessed church. God does good things here. Are we a perfect church? No. We're about that close. But we, we have a very good church. And what we want is to have a good church, we need to be a healthy church. And if we're going to have a healthy church, we have to have healthy church people. Have you know, not everybody that comes through those doors are going to be healthy people. We need to remember where we come from. This is something that disturbs me. People that have been saved for a long time forget where they come from. I will tell you right now, do not ever let the sins of your past hold you down. You have been forgiven, and those things are far from you, the Bible says, as the east is from the west. But never forget where you came from. Somebody heard me today. Don't ever forget where you came from. Don't ever forget. Don't let the guilt sit there and hammer you. But never forget what that guilt felt like. I remember those moments where I couldn't look myself in the mirror because I knew I was guilty. Because I knew I wasn't right with God. I can look in that mirror now and I'm fine. Except for looking at the gray hair or the double chin or whatever. But I can look in that mirror and I don't despise my soul. But I never want to forget what that was like. Because people that walk through those doors sometimes still feel that. They need to know the loving Jesus Christ we have here. And so we are at a church that needs to be have those doors open. Have them open. We may not agree with them. We may not agree with their lifestyle. Listen, that's God's job. That's not ours. Our job is to present Jesus to them and then let the Holy Spirit go to work. So as we're dealing with having a healthy church, we're talking about something big in a, in a small setting. Some of you may have heard the term of, of uh, being a New Testament church. Some of you may have expressed the desire, I long for our church to be a New Testament church. What would that mean to you to say, I would love to be that New Testament kind of church? What, is, what does that mean to you? Do what? Yes, but I don't think that's where they're going with it. At least not my perception of it. The, uh, what was the New Testament church like? Well, you look at the book of Acts. Which all they had was the Old Testament. That's, that was the Bible of the day. Jesus preached the Old Testament. So don't get rid of it. But the New Testament church, if you look at the book of Acts, there was all kinds of things happening. There were, there were, the miracles were taking place. Uh, people were coming to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. God was restoring things that were broken. Uh, uh, people found unity. It was an amazing thing because the, 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 the ground at the cross was level. I mean, you had the, the high highs and the low lows, and yet in Jesus, they were equal. They were one. And so when we talk about being a New Testament church, that's, that's what it means. And if we would be a New Testament church, then one of our main attractants would be intimate fellowship found within small groups. The intimate fellowship that we would find inside of small groups. Because in the book of Acts chapter 2, that's exactly what you find. So our shared characteristic for this week is dealing with holistic small groups. Holistic small groups. Now the Bible goes on, and, and, and we're going to look at a couple places here, and then in the book of Acts, 
But uh, uh, in Matthew chapter 18, verse 20, it says this, For where two or three are gathered together as my follower, followers, I am where? Where two or three are gathered together, the Lord says, I'm right there with them. How do you know you could have church in the parking lot of a Whataburger? I know you can because I led a boy. Took a, uh, a youth group to a... a um, one of the haunted house is what they call a hell house. It's it's meant to you see these scenes portraying death, kind of like uh, uh, heaven's gates, hell's flames that the Baptist church did in Florence the other day. And you see these 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 deaths, and they all stand before Jesus, and uh, uh, and you see these people that they're not going to make heaven because of their lifestyle. And they give an altar call, and I remember we took some kids to one of these things. It was called a hell house, and and. When it was all said and done, we were, we, we were in north of Dallas, up around Plano, stopped at a Whataburger, and uh, uh, the kids kids were going inside, and this one teenager pulled me aside, and he said, Pastor Mike, can I talk to you? And I said, yeah. And so we're standing outside, and, and, and he's talking about these fears. He's talking about these things. I said, listen, do you even know Jesus as your Savior? If you died right now, you're afraid of death. Do you know that, that, that you'd make heaven? No, I don't. I said, would you like to? Yes, I would. Led him to Jesus right there in the parking lot. Guess what? Two were right there together. Where was Jesus? We were having church. We were having church. And so it's very emphatic. Jesus tells us whenever, and you don't have to have a large group. You can be in a small setting and see God move on a, on a large scale. Holistic, not to get, because that seemed like a new age term, but holistic simply means pertaining to the theory that the whole entities are, are more than the sum of their parts. It's not talking about the whole, it's talking about the individual. It's talking about these pieces that make up the whole. And so we minister to the body, the mind, and the spirit. Not There's different parts within the person, then there's people that make up the whole thing. And so we want to minister to people as a church, to the body, to the mind, and to the spirit. Now how have you know when we get together on Wednesday night and we get hold of some of that food, we are ministering to the body. Hallelujah. I thought I'd get a better amen than that, Mickey. I'd, I'd... But we minister to the body, the mind, and the spirit because that's who you are. Take away the body. The body dies. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be buried one day. You still have something left. And we want to be able to minister as a church to all these different things. Now, growing churches have developed a system of small groups where individuals can find uh, uh, an intimate community. They can find practical help. They can find a, a very intensive spiritual interaction whenever they come together. And it's not just discussing or listening to the Bible, but it's applying the insights into everyday things. Um, who is it that does the, the the financial class? Dave Ramsey. So you sit in Dave Ramsey's money matters thing, and and he'll talk about money, but the underlying thing of money is a spirit. There needs to be a change in how you view God, and that helps you figure out how to take care of your finances. So there's literally anything that has to do with you, there's a spiritual component to it. And we as a church have got to be able to minister, well, how do I parent? Good question. Let's find out how biblically we need to be a good parent. How do I be a better husband? How do I be a better wife? How do I be a better employee? How do I be a good citizen? The Bible addresses all of these things. So we have to, when you have small groups, you're able to ha be able to minister in these different settings. Now in the book of Acts, we see a wide, sin, a wide use of small groups, particularly those that were in homes. Now in Acts chapter 5 verse 42, it says, And every day in the temple and from house to house, they continue to teach and to preach this message, Jesus is the Messiah. So we understand that the work of God wasn't limited to the house of God. That literally every house was turned into a house of God. Then in Acts 16.40, it says, When Paul and Silas left the prison, they returned to the home of Lydia, and there they met with the believers and encouraged them once more, and then they left town. Here was a church gathering in this woman's house, and they were able to go and minister to the people in that setting. Uh, uh, Acts 20.20 20, 20 says, 
uh, says, I never shrank back, Paul says, from telling you what you needed to hear either publicly or in your homes. And then in 1 Corinthians 16, 19, the churches here in the province of Asia uh, send greetings in the Lord as do Aquila and Priscilla and all the others who gather in their home for church meetings. The home at that point was about the only other place you could go. A lot, of, a lot of the temples and synagogues you couldn't go to because they were still filled with the Jews of the old mindset that were attacking the Christians. Maybe you could go to a local synagogue, maybe you couldn't, but you always could go to somebody's house. Now, how are you thankful that we don't have to just come to the house of God and we don't even have to invade your house so you don't have to clean it? You can go to D-Boons and have Bible study. I remember watching, uh, uh, how many remember the old, the old men's, um, uh, man, it was a movement that, that went across the country back in the 90s called Promise Keepers. I remember being at a restaurant one time for a conference, and my pastor and I, we were there for breakfast. We were eating breakfast before we went to this conference, and there was a group of men sitting around at a Denny's all having a Bible study at like 7 in the morning. Loved it. Can you have, can you have a meeting at Denny's? Sure, because it takes forever to get your food. So you're going to have some church while you're waiting on it. Thank you, Lord. So there's a, a church pollster by the name of George Barna who defines small groups as weekly Bible studies apart from Sunday school and 12-step programs. Uh, we happen to have some small groups here. Somebody tell me what some of our small groups we do have here. Quest, there's one. Huh? Cowgirls of Faith. So yeah, when everybody answers at one time, it's like, ah! So we have men's group. We have women's group that don't meet, you know, during, it's not Sunday school. You have a, a, a younger ladies group starting. You have a, we're, we're in the development stage right now of getting our young adults group together where they can have Bible studies and they can go out and, and, and uh, have fellowships and stuff like that. Um, quilting. Quilting is one. Gail, do y'all talk about Jesus in that? But he's always welcome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. G Jesus is sitting there going, I, I'm fish and loaves. I can handle the quilting. <laughs> I don't know. What to... You can, in the quilting, because literally all you're doing is finding a need and meeting it. Because there will be some women that will show up to quilting. Quilting is the excuse to get there. But when they get there, they hang out with these other spiritual women. And, and it's the conversation that's being had that helps. How do you know what I'm talking about? The, the shooting club we used to have uh, here uh, before <laughs> COVID and ammunition went through the roof. I think that was an excellent ministry. Now it's a rich ministry <laughs> to be able to purchase all that. So you have these different things that's, that's literally just meeting a need. There's a church in, in uh, Birmingham, Alabama called Church of the Highlands. And uh, they organize groups around whatever things are out there. Motorcycle riding, ballroom dancing, marathon running, volleyball, painting, politics. I, I sat at First, uh, First Assembly God Church in Phoenix, Arizona, and they did a thing called the Parade of Ministries. Ninety different ministries came walking across that platform. They had a dog walking ministry. Well, what's that about? You're ministering to the owner. And, and matter of fact, what they would do is instead of because you got these bougie people that you know have to pay people to walk their dog, and uh, mine, I just lucky if I can find them. They, you know, they're country dogs. But what they do instead is they they offer dog walking services, but they do it for free, so they have a chance to minister to the owner. See, whatever wherever there's a need, you could do it. Barrel racing, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, uh, any, any, anything, any, anywhere you're at, there's opportunity to minister to people. And if there's a need, if there's a, a thing that people gather together, maybe you can find a way to incorporate Jesus in it and suddenly you have a small group. Do you hear what I'm saying? Literally, ministry is hampered by our lack of imagination. That's all it is. That's all it is. 
and and you could get a you could if you're an accountant you could get with other CPAs and y'all could talk numbers and Jesus, you know, I, I Jesus I get the numbers part I don't, but they have stuff in common. See what I do is I get with other pastors, and we talk together, and we're not necessarily preaching to one another, but what we're doing is encouraging one another. Small groups that were that were available back then ministering to people in the place of their need is something that is part of healthy churches around this world. The good news is, is we have small groups. The good news is, is we have small groups. Oh, hallelujah. You're with me on this. Praise the Lord. The... You're slow, but you're worth it. I, I'm winding you up. Winding you up. Y'all are feeling all that bread. And I, I get it. So the, the question is, is what groups could we start? What groups could we start? Where you have, a, you have a hobby, you have a niche, and you'd like to have people get together and... and uh, uh, I'll pick on Mike Kersey. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> Fishing. Have guys that get together and 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 do a did a little daylight launch. They go out, they fish. Who knows? Maybe they bring them all back together. They weigh them. Have a little jackpot. Maybe somebody wins. Flay them all out and cook them right there. But have have moments where you get together and you can speak to one another. A church garden, absolutely. I, I'll eat it, but I ain't. These thumbs are black thumbs. They ain't green. I'll kill stuff. I'm telling you right now. I, <laughs> my weeds proliferate. I, I, so what happens is, is with small groups, we find needs and we meet it. What's the thing that you love to do? Maybe that could be a ministry right here where people gather together. Uh, my wife had one one time where she does some sign language and uh, uh, they were doing a, a sign language thing for like singing specials or or teaching people how to do sign language so suddenly people are coming together and they're they're learning this but they're interacting as well have you understand it was never about the activity it's about the gathering that's what it's all about so there's nothing sacred about ministry the message is sacred but the method is not sacred you can do it on the back of a horse. You can do it in a boat. You can do it out on motorcycles. You can do it in the middle of a garden. You can do it out in the deer woods. I'm in the wrong church. Well, we would literally have guys. We we there was public land in in Arkansas, and so we would we would stake out some some public land here. Had a few guys that had travel trailers. We'd park them out there, and uh, and we would spend a weekend just out there hunting on this public land and, and we'd fix food and we'd sit around. But we got a chance to minister to one another. Around the campfire. Come on. Don't get no more spiritual than that. So we're only, we're only hampered in our ability to have small groups because of our lack of imaginations. Well, God can't move through that. God can't do that. What is it that God might be saying, you know, this would be a good thing for you to do. And so because, it, again, it's not about the activity. You got motorcycles, y'all want to go on a bike ride, you know, stuff. I, I don't have a motorcycle. You do what you do. Craig, you know, I pick on Bubba, but he's not here. You, you go out on a bike ride and, and you wind up, you wind up, you know, all going together and you wind up at a spot where you're going to go eat lunch down in Marble Falls or over in Lano, you know, have a good ride. And you stop there and then while you're stopped, you're able to minister to one another and you never know that all those mo motorcycles parked is going to cause some attention. You may have other guys in motorcycles pull up and before you know it, you've had opportunity to witness to people. Think about that. How does God not win when you do stuff like that? So a church, we, we, and I'm a firm believer in Sunday school. Let me just tell you right now, I know I'm preaching to the choir, but Sunday school is necessary. It is the discipleship arm of the church. It is not a necessary evil. It's in order to equip you to know the Word of God better and how to live it better. 
So I want to encourage you, if you're not in a Sunday school class, we've got great Sunday school classes. If you want a different class, help us start a new class we'll, so that we can minister to, to different groups. I would love to have, the only thing hampering us is classrooms. We need space. But to, to have the opportunity on a Sunday morning, I, I will never get rid of Sunday school because unless you offer me an alternative, that's the discipleship arm of the church. Jesus did not say go out and make converts. He said go out and make disciples. Disciple makers who make disciple makers who make disciple makers. We're to be growing in Christ. And so to have, have the small groups that do meet on Sunday mornings, that may meet on a Wednesday night, something that I want to do here eventually. Uh, uh, but even to have those small groups that meet on a, on a Monday, they meet on a Tuesday, they meet on a Thursday, game night on Friday. That needs a little redeeming. But I will admit, but I, I get tired of losing. But, and, and, and the poor people get stuck with me playing 42. You know, it's, it is what it is. But you could, no, that ain't going to happen. But what you could have is, because I'll tell you right now, on a game night, man, we got, we got all kinds of food, more food there than we can eat. And we're out there to play games. But I'll tell you, if somebody said, you know what, I have a need. I can tell you right now, every domino and every card would go down. And we'd have prayer meeting in that room. Because that's what it's about. So let's, let's bring this to a head here. And I want us to look at, on the back of your paper, how do we see holistic small groups functioning here? Let's look at this. So Brother Schwartz, the one who wrote the study that we're going through, said, Christian small groups are not a nice yet dispensable hobby. No, it is the very essence of the true life of the Church of Jesus Christ that is worked out in small groups. What does that? What would that mean to you? Because maybe you haven't, and the small groups may be a newer concept to you. You may not have seen this before. There are some churches that actually have, like on a Sunday night, we have Sunday morning service, and then Sunday night, everybody's at somebody's house. It's all scattered around. Uh, different communities. You'll have uh, uh, eight people at your house and eight people at your house and eight people at your house. You, you spread it around like that. And generally what they would do is they would, they would speak a, a, a message uh, on Sunday morning and then that evening they could actually get into the, the meat of that talking with people. They could actually get deeper because how you know you can get pretty deep when you're not you know, stuck on a, on a clock schedule. You can, have, you can have longer conversations about stuff. And so to, to have small groups is not something that's, oh, that's nice. That's, that's, that's good to have that and that. No, it needs to be something that's in our lives because that's really where our friendship circle is. That's really where our community is. That's where our fellowship is found. And that's where the deeper conversation and the deeper maturing takes place. When you can sit down and have a conversation instead of just sitting here listening to a talking head behind a cedar pulpit. That's right. Because they're walking with you through your things. Spiritual growth, yes. And, 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 I, and I can't overstate it enough. The friendships. We need to have close friendships in this church. But I warn you with this, you're only going to have a friend if you be a friend. Number two, small groups offer intimate community, practical help, and intensive spiritual interaction. Are these important for the church? So you agree with me on that? It is important. And it's something that's not going to be found necessarily on a Sunday morning. What I love about Wednesday nights is the dinner. I love the dinner, besides the fact of eating. It's the fellowship, the chance to sit around a table with people and have that opportunity as you're breaking bread to talk to one another, to get to know one another, to find out how your week has been, what's going on with you. I, I, more than once, I've had interaction like that that meant more to me than anything that happened in here because it met a need. Why? Because we're two or more gathered together. Jesus was right there at the table, at that spot, um, to have that community. 
the help, the interaction with one another. Uh, uh, that's what I like about, and I know it's it's kind of in, really in passing, but on Sunday mornings, after we pray, and I say, turn around and shake a hand, hug a neck. What are we doing? We're trying to show people we care. And we're trying to enlarge our circle to get to know people. I encourage you, get to know people when you go shake a hand. Find people you don't know. They may have been coming to church here for a while, but you haven't quite crossed paths. Go meet them. You never know that your next best friend may be that person that you shake hands with. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody was asking me, and I can't, I can't remember who it was. You're going to have, have to volunteer the information here. Somebody was asking me uh, since we've been here, what's the, what's the toughest thing we've had to, had to deal with here? And I said, literally, it's all the different belief systems we got in here. You can be in a Baptist church, and not everybody agrees with you. You could be pure Methodist and you're not on board with each other. But being here, we have one thing that brings us all together in common. Two. Two things that bring us together in common is that we all love Jesus and we love the country culture. That's what brings us together. When we start there, we can work our way out from it. And listen, here's the thing I do not want. Do not get into a religious argument Because we're saved. We have so much more in common. We are one. Do we always believe together? Do we always agree with one another? My wife and I don't agree with one another on occasion. But she's always right. So some, some unnamed individuals in our church gave us a couple coffee mugs that the mind says, Mr. Wright, and her says, Ms. is always right. <laughs> I thought that was tacky myself. But. No, no. no. Amen. Amen. Yes. That meshes with my spirit. Yes, it does. Okay. So, number three, what are the greatest fears and prejudices that we have towards small group ministry and can it be done in a healthy manner? Here's my, here's, this is the one thing that pastors cringe about when we talk about small groups, especially when they break out into homes, is usually you have some illegitimate churches formed out of a small group. Let me help you with something. If you're ever in a small group and it turns into, I don't like the preacher, I don't like the worship, I don't like this, I don't like that, be very careful of that small group. Okay. Because that's not building cohesion, it's building divisiveness. And what we find is that you'll have this one group, none of them like, you know, they, they're all together in not liking usually the pastor. And so they, well, you know what, it'd be different if I was your leader. Oh, come on, somebody. Don't tell me you, <laughs> that ain't never happened before. It has. And that's how new churches get, get started. Listen. I don't, I don't like churches getting started that way, but if you can reach people that I can't, hallelujah. That's my only concern with small groups. Never be a part of a group that focuses on the negative. Let me say that again. That feels very spiritual saying it. Do not be a part of a small group that focuses on the negative. It's all bad. It's all terrible. Don't be a part of a small group where a leader expects you to just about bow down and worship them. You're not going to catch your pastor acting that way, so no leader should act that way. We are nothing as spiritual leaders. All we are is a conduit trying to get you to that cross right there. That is all. I'm not to get in the way of that cross. I'm to help you get to that cross is all it is. So be very careful of, of leadership worship or leadership degradation. Okay? 
Be very careful with that. How do you know it's very easy to be negative? It's very easy to be negative. Don't be a part of negative things. Get the negative things out of your life. Look at your neighbor. Tell them to straighten up. So small groups can be healthy. Small groups can be healthy. But it takes, it takes intentional action to make sure your group is healthy. Otherwise, I mean, all you're going to do is sit around bellyache. You ever gone out to dinner with people and all they do is bellyache? They're not that much fun to hang out with. They're really not. Saw a thing on, on, uh, uh, on Facebook today where these, these women would meet together for lunch once a week. They all work together and they go out to eat. And the one that gripes about their job is the one that has to pay the bill. <laughs> if the best thing you can say is these some good fajitas, you know, that's the best thing you can say. Okay, hallelujah. But if you're going to gripe about the job, you've got to pick up the tab for everybody. We need to make that a practice. We need to make that a practice. Yeah. If y'all invite us out for lunch, <laughs> be very careful. Number four, are you still excited about becoming a New Testament church? I am. I am. Because the New Testament church, what it had going for it was, number one, they, were, they weren't sure what was going to happen. The government could come down on them at any moment. They could storm that door and kill you and get away with it. How do you know America is starting to get that way? And in many places around the world, it's already that way. What the church had going for it was they had nothing else. They needed one another. Did you ever notice that churches do great when the persecution's happening, but when everything's fine, churches don't do that well? And so Christianity bloomed when somebody tried to step on its neck. Cuba, China, Russia, I'm telling you, when they start to step on it and to push it, all it did was go underground and get bigger. It's, yeah. And so what happens, what happens is, is that New Testament church, what they had was they needed one another. They needed the love. They needed the fellowship. You're rich. You're poor. You're of that ethnicity. You're of that ethnicity. It didn't matter. We were one in Christ. Amen. A New Testament church, when we get together like that, you can't help but have faith. You want to be together. You want to see the miracles happen. You're so hungry and desperate to see God move. Listen, man, I want to see God move. I don't want to be a dead church. I don't want to be a religious church. I want to be a church where God moves. God's doing something in people's lives. I, they drive by and they just feel God. We are having church one Sunday night. I'll never forget this. We are having church one Sunday night and a pizza delivery guy showed up at the back door. I thought... Who on earth delivered a pizza? But then at the same time, I'm like, pizza? He said, I was driving by and I felt the presence of the Lord. And it convicted him. And he stopped. He had delivered his pizza. It, so he wasn't going to get a late fee charge. But he stopped, came inside, got saved, and became a part of the church. You know God's in the move when it's splashing out into the street. People are walking by. They hear things. I'm bumping into people all the time. Where do you go to church? Well, I'm at the Maxdale Cowboy Church. Oh, I hear that's a good church. I don't tell them I'm the pastor. <laughs> that may go south fast. I, me and Paul, we were at the rodeo meeting the other day, and I, I can't remember his name, but uh lived down here. But he said... Uh, he. Because he said he lived on this road. And I, I said, uh, well, yeah, I know where Paul, Paul lives. I pastor the church right across. You're the new pastor over there? Yeah. He said, "He said, I've, I've heard some good things about you. What's my standard answer to that? She didn't want to tell you. The bad stuff's true too, you know. <laughs> I keep a humble attitude. But I love how I, can go, I go places. I know about that church. I've heard about that church. I've heard God's doing some things out at that church. At the HEB in Belton. Hallelujah. I asked where she was. She asked me where was the church when I told her here. And she said she was 
she had heard of Maxim, she heard that there was good things going on here. Mm. Like, oh. <laughs> and sister board member, you kept your mouth shut about anything <laughs> negative. <Yeah. laughs> well, we got this and these people. Yeah, yeah. Shut your mouth, lady. <laughs> and that's what we want. That's what we want is to have these relationships. And sometimes these relationships grow spontaneously, organically, because of what we have in common. And so that we can worship together, move together, do things together because and that's what that's what I want to plant a seed into your mind is this. If you have a if you have something you can do, is it something you can do for Jesus Christ and invite others? And just to use Gail as the example, quilting. That you could have a thing that's a hobby, it's a passion, and you could use it as a ministry tool, Amen. as a fellowship tool. Dorcas made robes. Dorcas made robes. Robes. Yeah. Robes yep. Widows. Something, something that you can do in the name of Jesus. Chew on that. Think about that because I'm telling you, when you have a healthy church, it's going to have these healthy groups that naturally need to happen. You have a job you need to do. You have a job you need to do in this church. What could God be calling you to? So Lord God, we thank you for this night. We thank you for this time. We thank you for this opportunity to gather together. And that Father God, we want to have the healthiest church we can have. We want to be the healthiest church family we can be. We don't want to, we're not looking to be the biggest church around. We're not trying to be the most popular church around. But Lord, if I'm going to aim for anything, I'm going to be the healthiest church around. Because Lord, I want to be a healthy church that inspires other churches to be healthy. I want to be a healthy man of God so I can inspire other men and other women to be healthy in their life with Jesus. So, Father, I pray right now that you would use us. Let us use our imagination. Let us not be guilty of just seeing three things we can do and that's it, but instead be asking the question, God, what else could we be doing in order to reach other people? Lord, I love you and I thank you because you are a good, good God who does good, good things through good, good people. Lord, watch over us. I pray that you give us all a safe trip home. Lord, use us this week to... To, to give glory and honor your name. Put somebody in our path this week, Lord God, that we can share the hope of Jesus Christ with because with you, Lord, I got hope. I'm going to make it through anything. And, and, and on the other side of that, I'm going to heaven. Father, help us to be able to share that hope and maybe we can invite somebody to be with us in church this Sunday. God, we give you glory and honor and praise in Jesus' name. Somebody love the Lord said amen. Yeah. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for coming out on a Wednesday night and uh, being with us. Be sure and shake a hand, hug a neck, because you like each other. If you don't like each other, learn to like each other. Act like you like each other. Get your dishes and your children. Be sure and take them all home.